So far in this series, the neural networks we've seen have been able to learn formulas and make decisions. However, they haven't been able to deal with a stream of data. In other words, they cannot remember anything about the previous input. In this video, we will look at recurrent neural networks, which can remember. Like before, we will dive into the details of how they work by building one in a spreadsheet. I know there's a lot going on in this diagram, but we will go through every arrow and circle before the end of the video. More importantly, we will discover how a computer can remember events, even though it's just working with numbers. The example we will design is a simple version of predictive typing, that is, guessing what letter the user will type next based on the letters they've typed so far. This same technique can be extended to predict words and even create longer form content like papers or role-playing adventures. Recurrent neural networks can even be hooked into convolutional neural networks to caption images or video. Before we jump into building one, let's explore the problem we're trying to solve a little bit more. Back when I was learning to read, the teacher would have us do an activity called popcorn reading. One student would start reading a passage from a book, and when they wanted to, they yelled popcorn, and then a name of a student to go next. That student would have to pick up right where the other student left off. Imagine you aren't paying super close attention and suddenly the teacher is telling you, okay student, start reading at the word assignment. In this passage, that's not too difficult to figure out where to start because assignment only shows up once. However, if the previous student was being difficult and ended at teacher or the, it would be much harder to know where to pick up reading. Because those words appear multiple times in the passage, you would have to guess. Similarly, a traditional neural network will struggle to do predictive typing of the word Mississippi. Let's look into why. Here we have a network with five input nodes corresponding to the five letters in Mississippi, a hidden layer of two neurons, and five output nodes indicating which letter comes next. Such a network should be able to accurately predict that I comes after the M because in this example data, that's the only possibility. Predicting what comes after the S though requires a guess. It could be an I that comes next or even another S. Same for P, there's two equally likely options. Guessing what comes after an I is even harder because it could be an S, a P, or a space because we're at the end of the word. Because our network has to guess, it is likely to suggest something like Mississippi or Mipipi. Not ideal for our predictive typing algorithm. What we need to do is make the network remember a bit of context. To do that, we will start by rotating our network so it fits on the screen. And instead of just outputting the predicted second letter, the network will also output a hidden state to be used to remember the information about what came before. Then it will use that hidden state and what the user actually typed for the second letter to make the prediction for the third letter. Effectively, we will have our network pay attention during a popcorn reading activity by continuing to pass along a memory of the previous state. This type of network is now called a recurrent neural network, or RNN for short. This is because the memory recurs, that is, it is repeated. A more compact diagram wraps the arrows from the hidden layer back into itself like this. In the literature, you will see even more compact diagrams like this on the right. They abstract away all the nodes in a given layer into one box or circle, and don't show all the densely connected weights. Just something to be mindful of when you do follow-up research. Back to our example, suppose our user types M and we feed that into the network. The hidden nodes will get activated to some amount, and our output nodes should interpret that state in a way to predict that an I comes next. Then, if our user actually types an I, or if we just take the prediction and feed it in, that I value will merge with the hidden state from before and predicts an S. This may sound good in principle when it's just a pretty colored diagram, but how does this actually work? How do the numbers remember anything? Think of this hidden state like a few variables that you would add to some code to impact the behavior of a loop. In this code snippet on the left, we use a variable since m to remember how many characters it's been since the network saw an m. Because Mississippi has 11 letters in it and m is at the beginning, if it has been 10 letters since we've seen an m, we know we are at the end of the word so we can predict space. Once we've seen a space, we might as well predict an M to restart the word Mississippi. Such code would predict the pattern of letters on the right. If we can have one of our hidden neurons remember how many letters it has been since we've seen an M, we would at least have the right structure. Similarly, we can have a variable track how long it's been since we've seen an I. This allows our prediction to print out an I, then two letters, another I, two letters, an I, and two letters, and so on. 
I hear you talking to your screen now. Hey, neural networks don't have conditionals or variables in them. It's just a multiplication, addition, and an activation function. You are absolutely correct that neural networks don't have if statements like a programming language. The cool thing though, is that we can make the hidden layer act like variables. And if we set our weights and biases just right, we can make that encode conditional like logic. Before we jump into the spreadsheet to start sketching in these weights and biases, let's draw up the conceptual plan. Because we have two hidden nodes, we can make a plot where each hidden node is one of the axes. The value we plot will show how our output nodes respond to that pair of hidden value nodes. Of note, we have multiple output nodes, just like when we were classifying letters. As we did then, we will only look at whichever output node is activating the most for any given point. If it's been a while since we saw an M, we should predict the space to end the word. Therefore, we want the node representing the space to activate the strongest in this blue area, where the hidden node representing since M is at a high value. After the space, we want our prediction to be an M so we can restart the word. We have at least two ways to implement that. Option one is to have the M node activate the strongest to the right of the region where the space node is activating. Option two is to realize that the space comes directly after the last I in Mississippi. That is, when the value of since i is low. This effectively splits the region vertically instead of horizontally. I chose to go with the second approach because it ended up being easier to implement. To accurately predict the letter s in Mississippi, we want the s output node to activate the strongest when both since i is low and since m indicates we are in the first two thirds of the word. The p output node should react stronger towards the end of the word when since m is higher. Finally, we will have the output node corresponding to i activate the strongest in this remaining region, when since i is high and since m is low enough to mean we aren't at the end of the word. To recap, we have five output nodes in our neural network that depend on two hidden layer nodes. We are designing the hidden layer nodes such that the value of one corresponds to how many characters have been in the input since we've seen the letter m. The value of the other hidden node corresponds to how many characters since the letter i. The colors show which of the five nodes should respond strongest for the given M and I values. With our regions color coded like this, we can now visualize how the input letter impacts the hidden nodes as a vector. That is, how our hidden node values move across this plane. Suppose our hidden values start off somewhere arbitrary, say in the upper left. Let us also suppose that the input letter is an I. Because the input letter is not an M, we will have the weight between the I input node and the since m hidden node be a small positive value. And because this letter is an i, we will have the weight to the since i hidden node be a large negative value, effectively resetting the count. With these updates to our hidden layer, we can see that we are now in the area where the strongest output node corresponds to an s, and that means our prediction is an s. Supposing the user does type an s, where we feed the prediction in as an input, the weight between the s input node and the since m node will be a small positive value, just like for the i input node. Because the input letter is not an i, we will have the weight to the since i node be a medium sized positive number. After that vector is applied, the hidden nodes are still in the region where the s output node is activating the most. Therefore, the prediction is an s. Supposing again that the next input is an s, we will use the same vector to adjust our hidden layer nodes. That takes them into the region where the I input node is the most active, so the prediction becomes an I. As we established before, if we see an I as an input, we add a large negative value to since I, and a small positive value to since M. This is the same vector as the first vector. Now our hidden nodes should be causing the P output node to activate the most, predicting a P. There's no need to reinvent the wheel, so we can just use the same strategy for seeing a P input as an S input. That is, we add a medium-sized positive number to since i, and a small positive number to since m. This keeps the hidden nodes predicting a p. Feeding that p prediction into the next input causes us to apply the same vector to the hidden nodes. This takes us back into the activation area where the i output node is the most active. This would be the third time we have seen an i, and we use the same weights, the same delta as before. This takes us into a new activation region, one indicating a space. The space indicates that we got to the end of the word, 
And because Mississippi is the only word we're training this network on, we want the next prediction to be an M. We don't need to be as precise as the other letters, so we can just move the hidden nodes all the way into the upper right of the activation area. Having seen an M, we need to set ourselves up to predict an I and restart the whole sequence again. We do this by using a large vector to the left. As we jump into the spreadsheet, we might have to play with the numbers to make sure we get two sets of ISS before IPP. We now have planned sufficiently in order to implement the diagram on the right. Remember that the black dots on the left correspond to pairs of values of our hidden layer nodes, which are remembered between inputs. The gray arrows on the left correspond to the weights between our input layer and the hidden layer, and the colored regions correspond to the weights between our hidden layer and the output layer. All of these pieces together correspond to training the network to predict the letters in the correct order to spell Mississippi. Feel free to go to this URL and follow along in the template sheet as we start filling in the weights between the hidden layer and the outputs. Here we are in the template workbook. This input sheet is where we will figure out the weights, and the RNN sheet is where we will put them together to make the RNN with this structure. With the help of this bubble chart here, we will experiment with the weights and biases for the second layer. The bubble chart shows us which of the output nodes is activating the most. Since we want the network to recommend an I when there hasn't been an I in a while, we will want to put a positive weight in the since I column. We will leave the since M column and the bias at zero for now. Let's look at the S output node. We will want the network to recommend S's towards the beginning of the word, so let's try a negative number in since M. That's probably going a little too high. We want our upper left corner to belong to I, so let's try a negative two instead. Okay, that's looking better vertically, but we will want S's for the first two thirds of the word. We wanna move this area right, so let's add a positive value to the bias. Yep, that's a bit too much, so maybe let's try a 0.5 for the bias. That looks about right. If you're feeling experimental, try a negative value for since I. Next up, let's try M. We want to output M when our hidden nodes are in the upper right, so let's try a positive value for both columns. Eh, that's covering way too much area, so we need to add a negative value to the bias. From experimentation, I found that we need to make the area even smaller, so let's use 5 for since m and a bias of negative 4. The last two output nodes will be a bit trickier because they both occupy the same quadrant of our plot. Looking at the p node, we want it to be sort of the opposite of the s node, so let's use a positive value instead of a negative value. And again, that's taking up too much space, so let's try adding a small negative bias. Okay, I don't like that little blue gap, so let's try 3.5 for since m. Okay, that's a little better. Let's go on to the space node, where we will try a similar set of weights, just a little bit more extreme. All in all, this looks pretty good. This colorful chart summarizes all five of these individual activation charts, and I find it really interesting to see both perspectives and how they come together. Now that we have the weights for our second layer mostly figured out, Let's start on the first layer, the weights between the input and the hidden nodes. One easy set of weights are the weights for M. If we see an M, we want to go all the way to the top left corner and restart. As such, we can put a big negative number in for since M, effectively resetting that variable, and a big positive number in for since I. Let's wait on figuring the rest of these out until we implement at least some of the network. The first thing we need to do is use one hot encoding to take our letter and turn it into a form our RNN can work with. Mississippi has four distinct letters, and we're also using a space, so we have a vector here of length 5 that corresponds to that vocabulary, that is, the letters we're using. One-hot encoding means that exactly one of these five boxes will have a 1 in it, and the rest will be 0. We can implement that using some if functions. We will be sure to reference the letters in the same order that we used in the other sheet, and make use of absolute references so we can copy these later. Next, we will use some product on this one hot encoding to grab the correct weights from the hot input node. These are the weights from the input layer to the hidden node, one of the three pieces that impacts the activation of those hidden nodes. The second component comes from the previous hidden layer value. We have arbitrarily started our hidden nodes both with the value of zero. We will use matrix multiplication between the hidden to hidden weights and the previous value. 
You may notice that we chose the identity for this matrix just to keep it simple, but in a real network, these weights might be trained to other values. The weighted sum for our hidden layer includes those two computed values and the bias. Again, to keep things easy, we'll have the bias just be zero, but it could be trained to something else in the real world. Just like with our traditional neural network and the convolutional neural network, an activation function is applied to that weighted sum. Instead of an exponential or ReLU, we will use a hyperbolic tangent function. This keeps our activation values constrained between negative one and positive one, and we find that it works better in practice than a regular exponential, mostly because of this extra negative range, effectively opening us up from one quadrant to four quadrants. Now, the activation of the output nodes depends exclusively on the values of the two hidden nodes. We will set up the weighted sum with another matrix multiplication between the hidden to output weights and the hidden nodes. As with matrix multiplication in general, the order we multiply these in really matters, weights and then nodes. We will also add on the biases for each of these nodes. Then we will apply some clever partial absolute references so that we can drag the values down and eventually over to these other columns. The last step is to apply an activation function to the weighted sums. Here, like in the convolutional neural network, we will use the softmax function to make sure the total activations add up to one. To compute the softmax, we will first compute the exponential of each of these weighted sums, including a little safety valve so as not to overwhelm sheets. And then we will sum up all those exponential values. Finally, the softmax value is the exponential value from above divided by that total sum. Look, our network is saying that it is about 62% confident that an I should come next, and 37% confident that an S should come next. That's great! We will come up here to feed the most confident value into the network as the next letter. This can be done with a somewhat complex formula that I left here for easy reuse. It searches for the maximum value and then the letter associated with that. Sort of like a VLOOKUP if you're familiar with that. We just need to feed the previous hidden values into this computation. And copy the computation over. Ah yes, we also need to figure out the rest of our weights between the input layer and the hidden layer. For the i, we said it should dramatically reduce the since i hidden value and have a small positive value on since m. Let's try a negative 2 for the first weight and 0.1 for the second weight. Oh good, the network is predicting an s comes next. Let's copy our whole computation chain over to the rest of the empty space. Let's use the same 0.1 value for the delta to since m for both s and p, since they all have kind of advanced one letter's worth. For the since i component, let's try positive 1, since that's half the magnitude we used earlier. Additionally, we'll have the weights for space put us all the way in the upper right corner by being large positive numbers. This lower chart here shows us how the since m and since i hidden node change as we see more and more letters. And it's looking a little bit strange. We can also expand this activation chart's data range a bit to see those activation points overlaid on top. Change the data range from QW16 to RL16, and then type in step in cell Q16. Those black dots on the charts are the steps, and they show us that we're not really moving horizontally fast enough. Let's try bumping this 0.1 weight to 0.2. Ooh, that looks really close. Let's flip over to the other sheet to see our letters and it looks like we're missing one of the middle S's. So maybe that one needs to be a bit smaller so we stay in the S activation range. Let's try 0.75. That looks great. Looking at this chart, we can see how the since M variable slowly gets bigger, effectively remembering how long the word is, and the since I variable is similar, but going up and down more often. This is how a recurrent neural network can remember states just by using numbers. 
Here on the left was how we planned the walk through our activation states. And on the right was how we were able to actually implement that walk using a bit of trial and error. In real life applications, how are networks actually trained? Going back to the diagrams of the RNN and the compact state, it is not clear how to resolve this circular dependency, that is, the self loop. To train them, we need to unroll them a few times, and then just treat this as one big network. Importantly, the weights for each copy of this unrolled network are the exact same, much like for the convolutional layers in other networks. That is, the weights between this first input I node and the first since M hidden node are exactly the same as the weight between the second input I node and the second since M hidden node. With those constraints in place, we use backpropagation to twist and pull the activation curves to get us closer to the desired training data. Just for fun, I visualized what a trained result might look like that can spell Mississippi. The result learned by the gradient descent backpropagation has a much more hectic behavior in the beginning, as we see on the left side of the chart. Then the hidden node surges to the right side of the chart for P, P, I, space, M, and falls right back into the chaos. To recap, we have seen what the thoughts of a neural network look like, and how those thoughts change over time. I find this visualization reminds me a little bit of a Turing machine, with a two-dimensional tape and the head moving all around the tape depending on what it reads. This behavior is only possible because we connect the memory cells from one evaluation to the next. This arrow, wrapping around, indicates that behavior in the compact diagram. In real recurrent neural networks, these thoughts will be way more than two-dimensional, maybe hundreds or thousands of dimensions, as a result of having that many hidden nodes. The more dimensions, the more thoughts can fit in the memory of our network. Even in these higher dimensions, the inputs cause our memories to move around that space following a certain vector. I hope this video has given you an intuition for how elementary recurrent neural networks work. Good luck with your use of RNNs, and happy learning!